Jack McGrath, I'm a lecturer at Sydney College of the Arts. Sydney College of the Arts is the visual arts faculty of the University of Sydney. So we have our own special campus where we do all things art, sculpture, video, photography, glass, ceramics, everything. Um, so that's the visual arts faculty. And when I moved from Armidale to Sydney uh, about nine years ago, I studied a Bachelor of Visual Arts. Um, and I studied film and animation. That's what I was always into, film and animation. So I made films, I studied film, I made animation, and I researched animation, watched a lot of cartoons. And then when I finished my degree, I did my honours. So that's like an extra year that I did where I got to just focus totally on my own research, which meant I took a year making a film. And as part of that, I went to the Rhode Island School of Design in the United States on an exchange. So I went there. That's the place uh, that uh, Family Guy, the guy who made Family Guy, Seth MacFarlane, that's where he came from. And the guy that made The Corpse Bride, who works with Tim Burton. So there was a lot of kind of animation stuff happening there. So I went there and uh, did a heap of research, made some films. And then when I finished, I came back and did my master's, which was a further three years where I made a film. It took me three years to make, so I made a stop motion animation. Those of you who are into uh, claymation, stop motion is kind of the category that includes all things that you do when you take a photograph and you make a small increment and you take another photograph and you make another small increment. When you put it all together, you have an animation. And so that's what I worked on during my master's. And now I teach at the college. So I teach first year, second year, and the master's program, and I teach in animation. I teach in 2D animation, I teach in live action film, and now I teach in stop motion as well. So my talk today is called Movie Magic, and the idea behind this talk is that anyone can make a film, anyone can plan and create their own work, put their ideas onto the screen. And most of the magic behind movies is actually pre-production, it's planning your own story, it's storyboarding and it's coming up with shots and putting those shots together to create a narrative idea. In essence, that's what's behind filmmaking. Now the cool thing is that everyone who has watched films either on, on, at the cinema, on YouTube, on TV, already knows this stuff. It's already kind of etched into our minds from growing up with TV, with growing up with the medium of film and animation. And pre-production and uh, movie making is about taking steps back and deconstructing that and working out how these films have been made so that then we can make our own. So after today, I'm gonna to give you a little step inside what I do, a, a sneak peek at pre-production and planning for movie making and animation and then after today, I'm going to leave you with an exercise so you can start creating your own movie magic. So, storyboards. Storyboard is like the visual blueprint, the plan that goes into coming up with a story. It's how filmmakers communicate. So it's like a, a writer will come up with a, a draft, or when you do um, writing in school, you come up with a draft, a first draft. A storyboard is like a visual draft of what the film is going to look like. Now, when I was doing my master's, uh, which I finished in 2010, I made an 18 minute stop motion animation film, which was 12 photographs for every second of animation. It took me three years to make. Uh, and I did a hell of a lot of pre-production and planning because if I was gonna spend so much time and energy on a film, I wanted it to be exactly right. So I spent a lot of time storyboarding and coming up with the film. I'm gonna show you a little clip of Journey to the Center of the Mind, the film, and then I'm gonna show you just a little sample of the storyboards that uh, went into the making of the film.
Are you unhappy, bored, or dissatisfied with your job? Do you feel unfulfilled? Ever felt like there might be more to life? Sometimes we need to look within ourselves to find the causes of this discontent. New. Dr. Lloyd now conducts private self-help consultation. Come in today and receive a free copy of his new bestseller, A Journey Inwards is a Journey Onwards. Hi, Jason. Oh, um, good morning, uh, Alexa. <laughs> Not working too hard, I hope. No, no, no. Just going through the uh, uh, CTR invoices and uh, uh, matching them to the current uh, financial data. Oh, well, that sounds great. I better leave you to it then. <laughs> yes, better, better get back to work. <laughs> okay, well, I guess I'll see you around then, hey? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, as we both work at the at the, the, the same place, and uh, well, well, we'll probably bump into each other. <laughs> and political trends for each of the large metropolitan areas. Here's Dr. Lloyd. Okay, I'm just going to stop that there. So anyway, the film goes on, took a long time to do, but a lot of the time went into planning those shots. And the reason I did that is because the emotion and the feeling of that scene comes from a particular order of shots. Now shots are every time the camera changes angle or changes place, we call those shots. And it's a montage of those shots a kind of um, a puzzle piece of, or a combination of those shots which gives meaning to the story. So the way that I created that kind of awkwardness and that nervousness and that boredom of Jason, the character in Journey to the Center of the Mind, had a lot to do with the kind of shots and I had to plan all that before I started animating. This is one of the storyboards. Um, there's actually 55 pages of storyboards but I'm just going to show you a few, don't worry. Um, you can kind of see that a storyboard is divided up into these different boxes. So it's a little bit like a comic. Um, these boxes are called panels and every panel represents a different shot. Okay, So I've planned out the different shots and you can see where it says shot size on the bottom right hand corner of the panels and I've got a WSCU, CU, CU, MS, CU. So that's the abbreviation for the kind of shots that I'm um, using. So wide shot, close up, close up, close up, mid shot, close up. I'm going to have a bit of a uh, more of a detailed look at those different size shots. And you can see I've kind of drawn out roughly what actually happens in the story. Now the storyboards don't have to be perfect drawings, it's not actually about great illustration, it's about just making your ideas clear so that if you work on a production with other people you're able to share your ideas and communicate your ideas. And that was very important for the film Journey to the Center of the Mind because there were 27 other people working on it and so when I was directing I had to be able to say you know this is what the shot looks like, okay, so it became a, a visual communication tool and also helped me plan for the production. So here's a few more Alexa enters, Jason turns around, and we have this awkward exchange between Jason and Alexa, which was very, very important, the close-up, which I'll talk about later for this scene. And then we have later Jason in the car, and that's where I, I stopped the example. So, shot sizes. Okay, so shots are always going to be different sizes, and the different sizes have different meanings. They have different effect on us as the audience, and it's the combination or the ensemblage of how you use those shots that gives meaning. So, the extreme wide shot, this is my little uh, Wild West example drawing, the extreme wide shot, really, really, really wide so that we can see the whole environment. In this case, we can see, you know, the desert. Okay, so that's where our, our film is set. So, an extreme wide shot sets the location. It's what we call an establishing shot and most of the time films start with an establishing shot and the reason this is is because the audience wants to know where the story is happening. They want to first be introduced, they want to have a bearing, they want to have an orientation to where the story is going to take place. If the story started with a close-up of somebody's eyeball the audience would feel disorientated. That would kind of be weird actually. So we need to see where we are. Extreme wide shot, okay? Then here is an example from a film called High Plains Drifter. This is an extreme wide shot. It's so extreme that the little guy on the horse is just this tiny little part of it. So he's dwarfed by the landscape. 
it shows the vastness of the landscape. You see the heat waves. Okay, so that's the extreme wide shot. It shows the vastness of the desert compared to the subject, to the character. Okay, then we have a wide shot. Okay, so a wide shot shows the location. In this case, we can see the saloon behind my little cowboy drawing. But it also shows the characters, so it introduces the audience to the characters. So if you see the character in full with the gesture, in this case, hands on the hips, maybe hands on the guns, ready to draw his guns, okay, we see the background and we see the character. So that's a wide shot. We know where we are, okay? We can't see a lot of detail with the character, but we can see the character in the setting, in which case, in front of the saloon in the Wild West. Here's an example from a film called Once Upon a Time in the West, where we see the wide shot, but we also see the wide shot from different angles, behind, in front. But in this case, it was important to see the wide shot because we wanted to see where these characters are. In this case, they're at a station on a platform. But we also want to see the gesture of the characters as well. Okay. <laughs> Mid shot. The mid shot or medium shot, MS, it is kind of like an in-between. So you can see the character's face now. You can see a little bit of the gesture because you can see kind of from the shoulders up, just like what you can see with me. I'm, this is a mid shot now. So you can see that, but you can also see some of the background as well. So you know where the character is, but you get to see their face. So you, you can see a little bit of a feeling in the face. And I'll talk about why the face is important when we move to the next shot. So here's a mid shot. This one is from Good, the Bad and the Ugly. We see a few mid shots here. Shoulders to the top of head. This is a wide shot again, but back to mid shot. Okay, the close-up. Okay, the close-up is very, very important because it shows the character's face. And the reason why showing a character's face is so important is because it shows the emotion. So as human beings, we read each other by looking at each other's faces, okay? So when you go outside in the playground and you start looking at your friends and you either see your friend's got an angry face or your friend's crying or your you know, friend's sad, excited, you're able to read their emotion by looking at their face, right? Sounds obvious. But that's how in filmmaking we're able to identify with the characters, okay? So we know how a character's feeling in that situation and it makes us empathize, it makes us identify with that character, okay? That's why we need to see the face. So the close-up doesn't show any of the background, but it shows the face. Very important for this next scene from the same film. Close-up on the gun. up on the gun, close up to back to the face, intensity in the face, you can read the character's anxiety, concentration, Clint's coolness, calmness. Okay, so very important for the character's emotion, particularly in that intense scene where they're faced off against each other and you see the close up of the gun back to close up of the face so you can really see their expression, their concentration, their anxiety. Extreme close up. This is why the Western is such a great example of different shot sizes because they really like to use the extreme close up. So the extreme close up is going to show even more of that intense emotion. It's going to give the audience more intimacy, intimacy, all right? So you can really see how a character is feeling. You see their subjectivity because you see the eyes. So when you, when you want to know how someone feels, when you meet someone, when you're really engaged with someone intimately, you look into their eyes and that's how you read their emotion. Okay, when people say eyes are a gateway to the soul, etc. Same for filmmaking. You want to see how that character feels inside, you look straight at the eyes, okay? And so for Wild West films, it's that intense concentration in the eyes when you have the showdown, okay? And here we go. Extreme close up coming up. So 
just after this. Boom, extreme close up on the eyes. And back to extreme oh. wide shot. Okay, so that film is a great example of as they start to move closer and closer into the characters as the intensity rises and then as the final gunshot goes off, we're back to extreme wide shots so you can see where the characters are positioned again, okay? Camera movement. Now, camera movement is another really expressive tool in filmmaking. One thing is it makes your film more dynamic, so when we see movement, it helps with the pace of the film, it helps with the excitement. We go on a journey with the actions through the camera movement, okay? So when the camera moves, we as the audience move with the action. So this is really important, particularly in action movies where they set up kind of jibs and dollies and special camera rigs so that you can really follow the action through the story. It makes it f much more dynamic. Now, a classic one is the pan. So you can either pan left or you can pan right, okay? And in the case of a storyboard, I've got it drawn in with these little arrows, okay? Simple, just left or right pan. Here's a little clip from uh, Braveheart where you'll see how the pan is used to reveal to the audience more information, okay? So a pan can be used to slowly reveal, to create suspense, to give the audience more information as the camera moves across the scene. So in this case, William Wallace as a small boy moves from his um, first location near the fire and moves around past the village hut and then sees the crew of people coming with the bad news of the death of his father. So there's no sound on this one. Okay, so we revealed that through that pan, okay? So that could, could easily be done with cuts. So you could cut from him and then cut to a wide shot of those characters coming. But the filmmakers have made it more dynamic by moving the camera so that we feel like we're part of the action as if as William Wallace is running, we are running around the corner and we get that new information as it's revealed and they come over the horizon with that bad news. It adds to the shock, adds to the feeling, emotion of that scene. The zoom out. So for storyboarding, I just do a zoom out by drawing a box on the area that the camera will start in and then putting arrows pointing outwards which shows where the camera ends up. So the zoom is the, the camera starts somewhere and then it zooms out and reveals more of more information to the audience, in this case the landscape. Okay, So in the storyboard it's just a box with arrows going out, a zoom out. So a zoom out shows information slowly to the audience, creates intensity. Okay, so another scene from Once Upon a Time in the West. We see the boy with a harmonica in his mouth. We don't know where he's situated, what the problem is. We know something's up and then we zoom out to see that his um, brother is actually standing on his shoulders and uh, is hanging from this uh, archway, okay? So that information is revealed through the zoom out. The zoom in, same thing but going in, okay? So you have more information you have a landscape or something like that, and then you're telling the audience, I want you to focus in on this part, on this subject or this moment. So you're guiding the audience's attention to a particular part of the subject which is important for the story. So you're telling the audience, this is what I want you to focus on, because this is important for the story, this is something you need to know. Okay, so this is an example of a zoom in, which is used to transition to a dream sequence. Okay, so we start with the character's face, and then we zoom into the eyes. So we zoom into the framework of an extreme close-up, but we're taken in there so that we can transition into what he's thinking of, his daydream. Takes us right into the eyes, right into the soul, so we can see. And then from there, it transitions to the dream sequence. Okay. Now, we have here a kind of summary of all of the different shots. So I've put them all out here. 
So the reason that I showed you these examples and I drew these is so that you can kind of see when you're constructing your own storyboards how best to represent those different shot sizes and different camera moves in a drawing form. Now the tricky thing about doing storyboarding is you're planning for the moving image. You're planning for something that has is time based, something that has movement, okay? But you've got to do that in a still, you've got to do it in a drawing. And so these are the little tricks and tips that I've come up with for trying to show that camera movement and show those shot sizes in still form. So there's no real wrong or right to storyboarding. The, more, the most important thing is your ideas as a director, as a, as a script writer, as a producer, as to what the story is going to be about and how you can communicate to that people, how you can make your story dynamic and interesting and create emotion, okay? So there's no wrong or right to how to do a storyboard. These are little way devices that I came up with, but many books that I've read on storyboarding explain that storyboarding is like an art, okay? There's no real right or wrong. Everyone works out their own way of representing these things on paper, and this is my way of doing storyboarding. So uh, you might want to grab a screen grab of this or we'll put it up later so that you can have a look and you can start to create your own storyboarding storyboards. So here is a blank storyboard template. Once again, there's no official storyboard template. This is just the one that I use that I'm comfortable with using. Some people said to me, I don't like that your boxes are so small. And I say, well, do you draw your own storyboard then? It doesn't matter. Okay, so it, this is just the way I like to do it. It gives me some nice structure to work in. You have the production up the top where you can write in uh, you know, the name, the title of the film. And then we can have the director. Who's the director? Is it you? Are you working in a group and you've chosen to have a director for this film that you're going to make? And so you can write in the director and then number your shots, okay? So where it says shot, you can up the top, you can say shot one, shot two, shot three, shot four, shot five, shot six. And if you're in the case of me when I made Journey to the Center of the Mind, I think I had 372 different shots over 53 or 54 storyboard pages, okay? So numbering the shots becomes really important later when you've got all these storyboards. Um, but the trick with storyboarding and the trick with um, film language and uh, making film is that you have to be as concise as possible, okay? So back in when they first started doing cinema, when they first started making films, they used to do everything in a wide shot. So you'd see all the characters, you'd see the whole environment, and they would keep it like that for the whole film, and they would do it all in one take, so they wouldn't break it up into shots. It'd be basically just one long, big shot that would just go on forever. So sometimes when you go back and you watch old movies, and you think, why is this so boring? Actually, the old movies are interesting because they came up with very innovative ideas back then, but the reason is, is because you've become used to, you've grown up, seeing all these snippets, all these exciting different shot sizes, all these dynamic camera moves. And when you go back to a wide shot, you're like that. You're like, this is boring because your, your mind's already hardwired to accept way more information than what they're giving you. And the reason they did this is when they uh, first started making cinema is the only reference they had before, the only history they had before was the theater. And when you're sitting in the theater, you're seeing everything from the same shot, right? You don't have the advantage of placing the camera in the scene, of getting really close up with the audience, of moving the audience's experiences through the location. That is what is so potent about film and that's why film is, uh, is so big, that's why it's all over the world. Um, so when you're coming up with your shots, think about how you can be dynamic and think about how you can break it up into close-ups, mid shots, wide shots and think about why you're using them, okay? And when I said be concise, it's how much information do you really need to tell the audience, okay? So if I was um, going to make a film about me coming in today and doing this video conference, I wouldn't have a shot that went for an hour with me on the train in a wide shot. That would just be boring, okay? And I wouldn't have another shot of, you know, 10 minutes of me walking along the road, okay? Not right. So it's not like real life. And audiences are smart enough these days, you guys are smart enough um, that we can accept little pieces of information and we can put them together in our mind and we can work out a story from there. So I could show a four seconds of me sitting on the train and then I could show another four second shot, wide shot of me walking along the path and then maybe a close up of me sitting down at this table. And if you watch that in just 12 seconds, 
you would get an idea of the events that took place and you would get an idea of the story. So be concise. Don't do sh a, when you're storyboarding, don't do three of the same shot size or the three of the same event that's happening. You can break it up, be concise, and that will help your filmmaking be more interesting and more dynamic. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I'll see you again soon.